Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. And you know, sometimes life takes the most unexpected twists and turns, and suddenly opportunity stands front and center. And an individual who uses that opportunity can make a huge impact for good on the lives of other people. Well, that's the real story of my very special guest on this edition of L'Chaim. It is my honor to introduce you to Sandy Frankel, who's making an enormous contribution to Jewish life today by supporting the work of amazing organizations and institutions on the Israeli scene. For Sandy Frankel is one of four members of the Board of Trustees of the prestigious Helmsley Charitable Trust, which, with Sandy's guidance, has distributed $150 million over the last five years to various Israeli initiatives. And actually, the story behind the Helmsley Charitable Trust's support of Israel is a fascinating one in the annals of Jewish history. Many of you may be familiar with the gossip columns that swirled around the late Leona Helmsley, wife of multimillionaire real estate entrepreneur Harry Helmsley. And then she became, in her own right, a hotel tycoon, known for being somewhat eccentric, reportedly not an easy woman to work for, and celebrated for leaving $12 million of her enormous estate when she passed away to her dog. And Leonie Helmsley was hardly an enthusiastic Jew. Rather, she downplayed her Jewish identity and never visited the state of Israel. But in her will, Leona Helmsley included a mission statement directing the trustees of the charitable trust that bears her name to, quote, do good things with the money, unquote. To do good things. And that's where Sandy Frankel enters the picture. Sandy knew Leona Helmsley especially well. He was her personal attorney. And in good rabbinic midrashic fashion of interpreting the text, Sandy Frankel interpreted doing good things to mean helping the state of Israel. Of course, life is never quite that simple. There's always more to the story. And so I'm thrilled to be sitting with Sandy Frankel to learn more about this exciting journey you've been on. And I thank you very much for joining us on L'Chaim. Thank you, Sandy. Well, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. you for having me. Um, I understand that there are four trustees who administer the Helmsley Charitable Trust and that you, Sandy, are the only Jew of the four. Is that true? Well, that when, when Mrs. Helmsley died, she named five people to act as her executors and, uh, of her will and the trustees of her estate. One of them was her brother, who was an elderly gentleman and passed away. I'm sorry. The, uh, the other four are two grandsons, uh, a former business associate, and me. So the four of us, together acting as a unit, have been liquidating the estate and transferring all of the money into the charitable trust. And, I see. And together, we set up programs for the trust to engage in, uh, one of which, an important one of which, is our Israel program. Okay. So is what I read not really correct? Her children are also... her. You say two of them are children of uh, grandchildren. Grandchildren. grandchildren, grandchildren, grandsons. Do they consider themselves Jewish? No, they they don't. But Mrs. Helmsley was Jewish. Okay. And she was aw very well aware of her Jewishness, even though uh, she wasn't a uh, someone who ever went to Israel, and she wasn't uh, a, a practicing Jew in the sense of going regularly to temples. She was very aware that she was Jewish. Okay. Is it correct you were her personal attorney? I was. Uh, yes. So you yes. did know her very well. Yes. Yes. Okay. I was, I was uh, uh, one of her lawyers for the last 18 years of her okay. life. And the reason I start this way is, it seems from what I've read, the impetus, the direction of using some of the funds from the trust 
to go to the state of Israel is your initiative. Am I correct? Well, that that was something important to you. For sure, it was something very important to me. But you have to look at the the large picture. The large picture is that four people who have never had anything to do with each other really from disparate backgrounds with different interests who suddenly had dumped into our laps in excess of five billion dollars with no mandate other than in essence do good work with it mm -hmm. and so each of us brought our own values our own passions our own interests and our own thoughts about where the money could do the most good to a collective table and we considered each other's thoughts and recommendations and for sure one of mine was uh, Israel and my colleagues agreed with that as a program area That's and so lovely. I've been a I've been the lead trustee on that program as they have been lead trustees on, other, on other programs that are of uh, importance to them. So I'm fascinated how this happens to you and who you are and how you come to be an individual for whom caring about Israel and applying the term do good things to helping Israel have, comes about. So I want to begin at the beginning. So who, you know, where do you, who are your parents and where do you grow up? And, what kind of Jewish home do you have as a young person? Well, I grew up in the Bronx, a block or so away from the Yankee Stadium. Oh, uh, in, were you a uh, Yankee fan? Uh, no, I was a Dodger fan. Good for you. The, uh, and uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, Jewishness was ingrained in my blood from the, from the beginning. Really? Um, not that I was a practicing or religious Jew. I, like, like most of my colleagues, I couldn't wait for Hebrew school to end, and I picked up very little of what was taught to me there, but I was very aware of my Jewishness and have been throughout, throughout my life. Mm -hmm. Who were your parents? My parents were very lovely, plain people. Uh, Named? And they were uh, Bessie and David. And um, we lived a pretty, uh, very simple life. We, in, in those days, they had nothing, we had nothing, but I was unaware of not having anything. Yes. We used to, you know, we, you'd break a, a, the broomstick off a, off a broom and you had a stickball bat, and that's the way people of my, in my area of my generation grew up. With a Spaldine? Exactly. Exactly. And you, right. you played with the Spaldine until the seam split <laughs> in the middle. Yes. Very good. So here you are growing up in this Jewish home. It is not terribly observant, but it has a strong sense of Jewishness, yes? Yeah. Okay. And then where do you go to school? Where do you go to college? I went to uh, NYU. In those days, NYU had a branch in the Bronx called the Heights, and that's where I went. It no longer is part of NYU. Mm -hmm. They sold it to City University, but at the time it was, uh, suited me just fine. Is this where, by the way, it's no secret, uh, Carol Lilienthal is one of our producers. Her husband, Peter, is here. It turns out you and Peter Lilienthal went to college together? Same time. Amazing how small this Jewish world is, right, Sandy? It, it, it really is. And I just bumped into him for the first time in maybe 40 <laughs> years outside your studio, and uh, he looks exactly the same, Has of course. Hasn't changed a bit. Not a bit. As have you. Um, so, you went and you decided to be a lawyer. So you go to law school. Well, in those days, you had to try to do something if you wanted to avoid the Vietnam War. Yes. And that was my way of avoiding it. I had no passion to be a lawyer. I did have a passion not to fight in Vietnam. Yes. By the way, it's interesting. Did you enjoy the law once you became a lawyer? It has its pluses. It has its minuses. It, uh, like anything else, there's, there's a, a trade-off. Okay. A, what became your passion? If it wasn't, and for many people, it's not their necessary profession, but everybody has a passion. What's your passion? Well, I've devoted myself as a practicing lawyer for over 40 years now, so you can't do that and be a happy, healthy person without feeling yes. some passion about it. So uh, that for sure was one. And now that I've been involved in the trust, the work I do for the trust, I feel very, very passionate about. Hasn't it given you an exciting extraordinary opportunity to do good? It's really unique. I pinch myself sometimes. I mean, how many people wake up one day having unfathomable wealth to help distribute? And the opportunity to do good things with it is something that I 
I, I try to think of other people who might have had that opportunity, and you can count them, I think, on the fingers of Absolutely. one hand and still Absolutely. have some fingers left. Yes. Where the passion for Israel, when does that develop in you? I think it's, uh, I think it's always been there. I, think it's, I, I can remember studying for the bar in 1967 after I graduated from law school, <clears throat> coming back from these tedious, tedious sessions, learning minutiae that were absolutely useless, and seeing on the television Abba Ibn speaking. And uh, this was when Nasser ordered the UN uh, observer troops away from the border. And Abba Ibn saying, what good is an umbrella when it's taken away if the rain starts? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 uh, the feeling and the love of the country has always been there. You know, it's interesting. I get chills as you speak. And I'm in rabbinical school in 1967. You're ready for the bar in 1967. Sandy, weren't those days harrowing for us? Of course, of course. And, they, and they <clears throat> people speak of it as a great victory for Israel. And I guess in an abstract military sense, it was. But close to 800 Israeli soldiers lost their lives. Thousands more were injured. <clears throat> There's no such thing in Israel as a great military victory. These mm -hmm. things all come with a cost, and every boy who's lost there is a tragedy. So the great six-day victory was a military victory, but it came at enormous, enormous cost. It's such an important point that you make, and I rarely hear it said, call out to you, that's very lovely. Incidentally, for many of us, and for Soviet Jewry, the Six-Day War became a pivotal point in contemporary Jewish history. And there was a revival of Jewish pride and a, and a, a burgeoning of Jewish identity among many Jews, even here in America, after the Six-Day War. And I was, I'm wondering whether in any way that affected you in a similar fashion. Well, I think Jews around the world, if I can generalize, were very uh, proud of what the country had done and how it had defended itself and the speed mm -hmm. and efficiency with which it had accomplished uh, a, an extraordinarily difficult task. But at the end of it, there were many, many grieving families there. And you know, people speak, when they speak of the Israeli wars and they count the, the dead among the Israelis, they don't necessarily think about the wounded. These are people who are very seriously injured. Their lives are impacted. Their families' lives are impacted. These are, <clears throat> every time Israel fights, it's a loss because if you lose one boy, it's a loss. It is so touching to hear you say this, and I'll say it again. I rarely hear people bring up this side, especially the Six-Day War, how does this happen that you are sensitive to that? What in your own life experience gives you the insight that there's no such thing as a successful war? By the way, war is, war is hideous, and we romanticize it in movies and on television. And no matter how bad a movie is or how bad a movie tries to show war, it's not anything. It doesn't come close to how bad it is. But, Sandy, is it fair for me to push you and ask you, how do you think it happens that this really is something that you're aware of and you speak of so gently and so beautifully? How, where does it come from in you? I, I think where it comes from with, with me is less important, if, if I may, than what we try to do about it. In, in the grants that we have made to Israel, uh, there are many, many that I'm very thrilled with having made, but we have made a couple of grants to Beit Halochem, which is the, uh, the rehabilitation centers for the serious, those seriously wounded in war and in acts of terrorism, to help these people. And I have visited those. And when you go there and you see people who have given <clears throat> much of their lives, 
their limbs, their ability to function physically as you and I are, are able to, and, and you see them continuing with life and thriving in their own way, and you see that you've been able to, in some small way, help that, it's extraordinarily gratifying. Mm -hmm. Again, wonderful. Incidentally, I saw a list of all of the institutions in Israel, which the Helmsley Charitable Trust helps fund. There are a number of hospitals, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, absolutely. Can you just remember some of the things, what are some institutions that you are really now helping to thrive in the state of Israel? Well, we've, um, we've made a number of grants in hospitals that I consider to be tragic, sad, sad grants. Uh, in the Rambam, for example, they have an underground gara parking garage that they can convert within 48 hours into a bomb-proof hospital facility where all the cars are removed and something like 1,500 beds can immediately be set up so that when they are attacked from the north, as they are and as they will be, they can continue to deliver services to people. It's quite extraordinary. On the walls, there are cabinets, which when you open, all of the paraphernalia of hospitals come out, 1,500 cabinets. Oxygen comes out. All of the equipment that you're used to seeing in hospitals comes out. So that's, that's one of them. The, the, the facility costs much more mm -hmm. than what we contributed toward it, but we contributed about $5 million toward it. There, is a, there are bomb-proof shelters in Barzilai Hospital in the south that we've helped contribute to. The, the hospitals and other sensitive areas are areas that are targeted by the terrorists. And so we have spent millions and millions of dollars to try to provide shelter for those places. We've just come back from, from the south a few weeks ago. To and who's see. we? My wife and I went down there with another trustee and his wife to see some of the things that we have done and to get ideas for how we can be helpful in the future. And, and when you see the proximity of, of these new communities in Israel to the Gaza Strip, it's really quite extraordinary. They're, they're, they have targets on their backs. It's, mm -hmm. it's incredible. And they need medical facilities. They need them for their normal lives and they need them for when they are attacked. Mm -hmm. So those are the types of things that, that we do. But health care generally for the Helmsley Charitable Trust is an important feature. Yes. I mean, I'm the right to say I'm proud of you, but I'm proud of you, you know. <laughs> um, when was the first time you went to Israel? First time I went to Israel was during the Eichmann trial. Did you I go sat, because of the Eichmann trial? No, but I was, I okay. was there. I was, this is uh, in the 60s? Was, yes. Uh, I was taken as a high school graduation gift. By and whom? I sat uh, by my mom. And I sat in the courtroom. You did? When with Eichmann in that bulletproof box that he was in with proud young Israeli police guarding him in that. It really leave, leaves quite an impression. Oh, my. I tell you, I'm getting chills. Unbelievable. What was it? How old were you? 17. What was it like? What did you feel in that courtroom? I remember, of course, I don't remember particular things that were said, but I remember witnesses describing, trying to describe, some of what they had experienced and some of what they had seen. And it's a courtroom, so it's somewhat antiseptic. And here they are in this antiseptic facility describing the most horrific types of things with this monster sitting in a glass box and me as a teenager, all I wanted to do was penetrate that box and give it to Eichmann. That was, I remember the feeling very well. Was it frightening at all? No, in no. Israel, I've been in Israel many times. I've never been frightened. It's the, never been it's frightened. The, it's the securest place in the world. I was just up, just a few weeks ago, I was up at the, um, 
in the Golan Heights, right on the, right on the border with Syria. And, and you, you were not hear the scared. Shell, and you can hear the shelling. You were not scared. You hear the shelling. Israel is a safe place. People should know it. They should go there. It's not when the way walk, it's portrayed, you When know. you walk off the plane, you feel it immediately. And the thing is, if you, if you walk in a dangerous area in New York, <clears throat> you look to your left and you look to your right and you wonder what would happen, what will happen, who will come here to protect me if something happens. In Israel, it's not like that at all, at least for me. When you walk down the street, you know that if something were to happen, people would come in and they would help. They wouldn't just turn a deaf ear. Mm -hmm. Your wife's name is Ruth. Yes. Does she feel the same way? Does she, she, feel, she, she, does she feel frightened sometimes in Israel? She's a Sabra ah. whose roots in Israel go back more generations than I can count. Amazing. How did you meet her? I met her in uh, New York in a uh, rooftop swimming pool where my bachelor apartment was on July 9th, 1974. How lovely for you. Yes, I was, uh, I was swimming. I came out of the water. She said, how is the water? I said, fine. Is that an Israeli accent? She said, yes. And fast forward, three children and five grandchildren. Mazal Tov. That is a fabulous story. So her being a Sabra, she is not frightened either when she goes with you. No, it just, she's a, it's, a, it's, it's not in, in your mentality. Sab right? Sabras aren't frightened. They're proud. <laughs> yes. They're proud of what they are and who they are and where they came from. And they know what their roots are. So sh may I assume you and your wife Ruth have been to Israel many times? Yes. Okay. You've seen an arc, then, in terms of how Israel has grown, matured, and also is still dealing with many issues. What's your, I don't know, what's your assessment? How would you share with, our, with the audience that's watching you right now all over America? What's, what do you wish people understood more, better, about Israel today, Sandy? I'll answer your question, but before I answer it, let me say this. The audience doesn't need to hear from me about Israel. The best way to learn about Israel is just go there. When you go there, you will see for yourself. You'll make your own judgment as to things that you read. Are they true? Are they not true? I can tell you that many, many are not at all true. But go there and see for yourself. Maybe you'll disagree with me. Maybe you'll see it and you won't like it. But I think the odds are real, really good that if you go to Israel and you haven't been there before and you use your own eyes and your own sense, your reaction will be, wow, I had absolutely no idea. What an extraordinary place this is. And, and people, when they go, will be able to put it into context. Here is this flower of democracy, this fountain of Western values thriving in a tsunami of terrorism, war, implacable hatred. And somehow it not only survives, but it thrives and it contributes to the world. So I would say to people, if you want to know about Israel, don't listen to some lawyer from New York. Go there yourself, and you'll see for yourself. And you'll have your eyes opened and your mind opened. That is a genius answer. Although I have to say, as I hear you talk, you are, you are a very effective window into what Israel is, just as you say it. So I'm going to ask the question then a hair differently. I want you to recall one or two memories. You already said here you were at 17 years old at the Eichmann trial. Not many people can say that, Sandy. But I want to know, of all the trips you've taken, either alone or with your wife, try to locate for me in your mind one or two of the experiences that stays with you, that then somehow epitomizes for you what Israel has meant to you. 
I would say that the essence of Israel isn't just the land, it's not physical structures, it's the people. Absolutely. It's the people there. And people that I have met, and I'm not talking about well-known personalities, I'm talking about ordinary Israelis and some Israelis who aren't ordinary but aren't that well-known. They're just an extraordinary breed. They have values, they know what's important in life, they don't deal with the, the picayune things that somehow eat up our lives. It's the people who are the most extraordinary things about Israel. I wish people got it like you got it. And sometimes, Sandy, when people talk about Israel, they talk about it as if it's an object or a concept or an idea. Israel is all about Israelis. It's all about people doing their best in you know this you call the tsunami. It's a, it's a it, they're this little island, in the midst of chaos and hate, and they're doing the best they can, as human beings. And when I hear you talk about how, your experience of Israelis, is that they have a value system and they have a perspective on life, sure. which very often we don't here in America. But well, as know, wonderful it is, it's you know we live in this spectacular social experiment called America. But in many ways, the values and the, and the priorities that Israelis have shaped are ones that are models for what you'd like people to really embrace all over the world. So to have you talk about Israel not as a, it's, not about, it's more than not buildings. It's not an idea. It is human beings in Eretz Yisrael trying to do the best they can to work out an a just, fair, loving, lovely society. And that's what you were able to articulate. So it's extraordinary talking to you. You were going to say something. Well, I was going to say people talk about Israel as being a small country the size of New Jersey. That's really an overstatement of, of Israel's size. The bottom half of Israel is desert. The top half is where 90% of the people live. So it's really half the size of New Jersey. And you know, when I drive north for seven or eight hours, I'm at the Canadian border, and a Canadian guard will look at me and let me pass through. In Israel, if you're in Tel Aviv, you can't drive seven or eight hour, mile, hours north. You drive a couple of hours north, and you come to a border where people would like very much to destroy you physically destroy you. It's just a different experience when you think about the size of Israel and the challenges that it faces and look at what it has accomplished, look at how it has become a light unto the na nations. It is, it's nothing short of miraculous. Mm -hmm. And I would urge people who may be watching this show who haven't been there Forget about what I'm saying, and if I may, forget about what you're saying. Go there, look for yourself, make your own judgments. You will be converted. Good for you. Is it true that you met with uh, President Shimon Peres when you became trustee of the trust, and that in essence, part of the, I don't know, I guess the direction that the Helmsley Charitable Trust has taken as it applies to Israel, has been influenced by Shimon Peres. Absolutely. On, my, on the first trip that we made to Israel after I became a trustee following Mrs. Helmsley's death, President Peres was kind enough and generous enough with his time to meet with, with us. And, and uh, I told him that the reason I wanted to meet with him is because his perspective of Israel from a historical point of view, from the heart of Jerusalem, is better than mine as a lawyer sitting on 45th Street and Park Avenue. And I wanted his suggestions as to what we should do with this opportunity. And what he said to me was, you should invest in our brains, because our use of our brains is what distinguishes us from the rest of the world. And so if you look at our 
list of grants, you will see that we've made grants to uh, of sizable amounts to major intellectual institutions in Israel. Every university in Israel has received large amounts of money. Uh, colleges uh, in Israel have received large amounts of money. We've invested quite a bit uh, in the Israeli brain. Mm -hmm. And again, that was the inside of Shimon Peres. Yes, absolutely. Was I mean, when you, th when you think about it, if someone suddenly put in front of you and three colleagues of yours five plus billion dollars and said, do good with it, what do you do? You, you think, you use your own values, your own judgment, but you speak with other people whose views and experience you respect. Mm -hmm. You try to mold all of that into a program, and what better person to speak to than the president of the country? You know, when you say that to me personally, it's very intimidating. It's frightening. It's awesome. Five billion dollars is almost beyond a person's imagination. And what a responsibility it is. And I'm, you know, I am sure you were doing, you've done wonderful things professionally as a lawyer on Park Avenue for years and years and years. But somebody puts five billion dollars in front of you and your three colleagues and says, now, you know, go do good with it. Isn't it an awesome responsibility? Yes, but you have to view it as an opportunity, not just as a yes, responsibility. Yes. And so you, you try to take advantage of the opportunity in a responsible way. And so far, I think we've done okay. Well, good for you. The other members had no problem devoting some of the money to Israeli causes. That's correct. Okay. Was there ever a political problem in terms of either where you gave the money to in Israel or did Israeli politics ever come into the issue in a way that was upsetting for you? No. We are not a political organization. Our grants are not political grants, not a one of them. None of them will be. We don't give to political parties. We don't give to politicians. We use our judgment as to what is best for the country itself, and that's where we make the grants. Very, very lovely. May I ask you also, as you look at the American Jewish community and how American Jews relate to Israel, young Jews and older Jews, how at the moment there seems to be some real problem with the way college campuses are handling issues dealing with BDS and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and Israeli you know, and the American Jewish left, American Jewish right. As you look at the American scene, American Jewish scene today, how do you feel about it? Are you optimistic? Do things trouble you about it? Are you concerned for the future of American Jewish support for the state of Israel? Speak just for a few moments about how you feel about both the challenges and vibrancy of American Jewry today. I don't masquerade as a maven in that area at all. Um, my, I do have views on it, but my views are just the views of a guy sitting at a table with no, no particular expertise. I can say this. A lot of the American Jewish community that I hear of speaks as if he or she is the prime minister of Israel. We have a lot of Israeli prime ministers in this country. But running, being the prime minister of the state of Israel is an awesome, awesome responsibility. One might say that it, that it holds in its hands the future of Judaism. Without Israel, I don't know that the Jewish people would last. And my own personal view, and it's not the view of the trust, because yes, the trust doesn't have such views, but yes. my own personal view is that before people speak and criticize, they should give serious thought to what the impact of their words might be, give serious thought 
to the enormous challenges of this tiny country in the middle of this conflagration and speak and act accordingly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at a map of Israel, you can't fit the word Israel on the map. You can't even fit the abbreviation on the map. You have to stick it somewhere in the Mediterranean. And these are just a handful of millions of people surrounded by many, many, many tens of millions of people who are really dedicated to their destruction. And I think that before people speak and criticize, they should just think for a moment about what the possible consequences of their words might be. And don't speak until you've thought through those consequences. The humility for which you are arguing is a very important lesson we should all learn. Americans used to tend to be humble. Um, and because of the responsibility you have to distribute charitable funds, I'm also interested in how you view the ethic today within American Jewry of philanthropy and whether you're concerned that the next generation of American Jews may not be as committed to Jewish giving as has become a tradition through your generation. Do you worry at all about the future of Jewish giving uh, in the, on the American Jewish scene? I hope it continues. I hope it grows. I, I think that right now, we are probably one of the largest private funders uh, in Israel. And I hope that years from now, our rank will go down to 100 or 1,000. And there'll be many, many more, bigger, and uh, perhaps more creative. Let them, people should go to the country. They will learn if they go to the country. And if they have funds to contribute, they will make that decision after they've seen for themselves. Mm -hmm. That is a theme you can continue to come back to. You really are encouraging anybody who has not yet been to Israel to get up and go. And I could not agree with you more. And it is a shame that there's such a small percentage of American Jews who've been to Israel. And not enough Americans have been to Israel. And you, know, you are correct to remind all of us, eyes are opened in a totally different way whenever you experience something, whatever it is in life. But surely, it is much better to have a sense of Israel personally than it is to get it from watching CNN, MSNBC, or even JBS. The best way to learn about Israel, which is your point, is to experience it yourself. And I hope people hear you. I'm going to come back to something we said earlier. Many people, Sandy, right now, believe it is dangerous to go to Israel. That there are, you know, we see the, the horrible pictures of rabbis being hacked to death in a synagogue in Jerusalem, or you know, Israelis suffering terrorism basically all over the country. You have, you know, you say you just were, you, know, you were in both the north and the south of Israel, but you were in near Gaza. And we just experienced in, in the summer of 2014 this horrific, again, a horrific war between Hamas and Israel where, you know, I tried to say over and over again, Israel was in a defensive war trying to stop of course. rocket barrage and tunnel incursions. And the war could have been stopped any moment Hamas wanted it stopped. All I had to say was no more rockets. And yet all we saw for days and days on American television were you know, Palestinian children who were being carried by mothers and fathers because they were the victims of some kind of Israeli assault in defense of the state of Israel. Let me and paint a picture for, for your listeners. When we were in Israel, and we just came back a few weeks ago, down south in one of the communities that borders the Gaza Strip, there is still a tunnel that came from Gaza. We went into that tunnel. The tunnel was 
large enough to stand up in and for several people abreast to stand up in. It was fully reinforced with concrete that should have been used for hospitals, schools, productive things, but was used instead for these tunnels. And the plan was that a group of these tunnels, several dozen, would one day serve as a jumping off point where several hundred terrorists at the same time would emerge with automatic weapons, with motorcycles, which they also had there, and on a coordinated basis would create a 9-11 type massacre on children, women, and defenseless men. That's what the Israelis faced. And until people realize that that's what they faced, and they faced 10,000 rockets that were in the storage facilities and then were being used, aimed at Israelis, not at military targets, but at Israeli civilian targets, unless you understand that, you really have no concept of what that was all about. And again, I'm speaking to you on a personal level, not as a trustee of a trust, but we saw it. And when you go to Israel and you see with your own eyes the challenges, to use a very weak word, the threat, the danger, there was going to be a massacre. And these terrorists, these hundreds of terrorists that were going to come out on a coordinated basis, were going to have with them and wearing IDF uniforms down to the IDF boots so that when the IDF finally responded, they wouldn't know who to shoot at. They wouldn't know if it was friend or foe. There was going to be a horrific, horrific massacre. And only when you really understand that and appreciate it can you form an intelligent view, in my opinion, as to the propriety of and, and the civilized manner of the Israeli response and the defensive nature of the response. Civilized response. It's a very important point you made. By the way, you speak so beautifully and I'm hoping that everybody, you know, not simply hears you, but hears you in a way that opens their eyes and makes them want to learn more. You are really an amazing person. Um, one last question. As you look at the sweep right now of anti-Semitism that is seeming to erupt and perhaps even begin to engulf parts of not only Eastern Europe but Western Europe, I'm wondering what you know, Sandy Frankel thinks about, again, I'm not asking, it has nothing to do with the trust. It's about you, you know, this Jewish kid from the Bronx who rooted for the Dodgers. What do you think when you see anti-Semitism like this now, and what does it say about Israel's role at the present time? It's dangerous. It's frightening. It's reminiscent of what was going on in Nazi Germany, and it has to be stopped now, unequivocally, forcefully, and without simply the use of words. People who are terrorists, who seek to kill Jews, should be stopped by all means necessary. There shouldn't be any pussyfooting around. These are murderers, and they should be dealt with as murderers, period, end of story. It's really quite simple. Mm -hmm. And Israel, in relationship to this? Israel is a, is, a, is a beacon. It should make all Jews proud. It is a, I know there's a bit of a brouhaha now as to whether Jews in France and other countries in, in Europe should come to Israel or should stay where they are and assert their Jewishness there. And people should make their own judgments. But I think Jews in Europe and all over the world should be proud 
that there is an Israel. If there was an Israel in the 1930s and the early 1940s, there would be a lot more Jews around here today. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, sort of come back to the beginning. One more opportunity for you. If you, to sort of summarize what you are trying to do as one of the trustees of the Chelmsley Charitable Trust in directing funds to institutions, organizations, initiatives in Israel that you believe are making a wonderful contribution, not simply to the Jewish state, but to the world as a whole. Summarize again for me what you're hoping to achieve in your work as one of the trustees of this trust. Well, it's only money. The people in Israel are responsible for making Israel what it is. But to the extent that money can be helpful and to the extent that our money can be helpful, I hope that we will in some small way help contribute to the security and the development of the country because contributing to the security and the development of the state of Israel is not just helpful to Israel and to Jews, but to the entire world. Sandy Frank, what a joy it has been to meet you. So you know, nice to meet you. Thank nice you. Nice to talk to you. Absolutely. You know, there is such soul to you and such understanding and sweetness. I really, your children are lucky to have you. Your grandchildren are lucky to have you. Would you put that in writing so I Absolutely. can give it to them? And I'm, and I'm sure you and your wife Ruth have done some extraordinary things together. I hope we get to meet each other often. Sure. Thank you. Success you in Thank all you. you do. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very, very, very Thank much. Thank you so much. Sandy Frankel, a trustee of the Helmsley Charitable Trust, which is having a major impact for good on life in the state of Israel and for the future of the Jewish people as a whole. What a joy he is. As always, I'd love to hear any reactions you have to any of the things that Sandy said. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall. Best of all, tweet me. I love tweets. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. Presentation of Jewish Education in Media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.